Tonight we're um, doubly honored to have two speakers who um, have both used our collections and their, the work that they've done will point to uh, records that we do have here at the State Archives. So um, the book uh, is, uh, that they're going to be talking about tonight is Paving the Way. Um, and it recounts stories of dozens of women who transformed California's political landscape over the state's history from the gold rush to the present. Um, the research for this book included lots of time spent here at the State Archives, um, going through over our collections, um, a few which are represented by materials that are on the um, exhibit tables. And uh, this is the, um, uh, we. Unfortunately, uh, Susie Swat was not able to be here this evening, um, and, but this is uh, Steve and Susie's second appearance. Their first talk was for their book, Game Changers, 12 Elections That Transformed California, which won the California Historical Society Book Award, um, among, among others. So to introduce the speakers, um, Steve Swat spent over 25 years with United Press International in Los Angeles and at KCRA-TV in Sacramento mostly as a political reporter. He garnered awards including a Northern California Emmy and was recently honored by the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences for his contributions to journalism and his community. Post-journalism career, he became a managing partner for a statewide public affairs firm and taught political communications at Sacramento State University. Um, I will mention Susie. Um, she spent almost four decades in the state legislature, mostly as a chief of staff in both the Assembly and the Senate, and she served as special assistant for the State Political Practices Commission. She won a National ProPublica Award for outstanding investigative work in the public interest. She currently serves on the Advisory Council of UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies and as a board member of the Friends of the California Archives. Jeff Ramundo spent nearly three decades as a political and public relations consultant based in Sacramento, and previously he enjoyed a 25-year career um, as a political and government journalist and editor with the Sacramento Bee and McClatchy newspapers in both Sacramento and Washington, D.C. He is the co-author of Game Changers, 12 Elections That Transformed California. So with um, that introduction, I give you Jeff and Steve. Uh, thank you, Nancy, and uh, congratulations on your 31 years at the uh, archives. Uh, Nancy is leaving as, as the head honcho, and so uh, it's, it's, um, we've enjoyed uh, working with you over the years. I know Susie has too. And I know the optics look kind of bad. You, you have uh, two men, aging men, talking about women's equality. Um, as Nancy said, Susie was supposed to be here. As of 1 o'clock this afternoon, she was going to be here. But she's caught this whatever's going around, and uh, she just figured, she, she just couldn't do it. So Jeff, who's also a, a co-author, along with his wife uh, Becky Lavalley, uh, just graciously decided to uh, to uh, fill in uh, for for Susie. And uh, uh, there are four of us who were co-authors, and so um, Becky couldn't be the the one woman to fill the bill because she's busy being a professor at Sac State and a, and a grandmother. So at the last minute, thanks to Jeff. Uh, when we wrote, uh, when we finished Game Changers, which was about three years ago, we realized that we had written about only men who had influenced California. I mean, who had, who had won elections, for example, or run major elections that changed California, whether it's Leland Stanford or Hiram Johnson or Pat Brown or uh, uh, Earl Warren, and we realized that women had uh, contributed a lot to California's rich political history, but you don't hear about them. You don't read about them in, 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 the, in the history books. And so we decided to f try to find those stories, do the research, and then tell those stories. And this book is all about storytelling, as our first one was uh, also. Uh, but we found some you know, fascinating, maybe we'd probably talk about uh, more than three dozen women and tell their stories going back to the gold rush. And some of the early ones, of course, were itinerant uh, lecturers on temperance, trying to convince uh, hard-drinking, hard-charging miners to give up alcohol. Good luck with that, right? Uh, but also there were women who worked really hard, um, former slaves who worked um, to, to gain equality back in the 1850s, 1860s. 
uh, women who fought to find their place and be allowed in the workplace at the professions they wanted, for example. And so those are stories that we tell. And they're generally considered to be a few waves that, that, that hit in California uh, regarding the women's political movement. The first one was suffrage. And then after that, you had the 60s and 70s, the, the, that wave of activism. And then you had 1992, which was the so-called year of the woman. And the question a lot of people are asking, are we in another women's feminist wa wave right now politically, given the women's success in 2018? And so we talk about that in the, in the book, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, this evening. Um, I'm going to start with uh, I'm going to start with suffrage, and then we'll move, move forward. So the arduous fight for suffrage, women's suffrage, really was a four-decade uh, affair. Uh, it spanned four decades, and women knew they would never be equal to men unless they had the vote. But men were very territorial, as I'm sure you know from your history. Every time a bill would be introduced in the legislature for women's suffrage, the male dominated, or the male entirely male le uh, legislator would legislature would find ways to, to kill it. Uh, women were not smart enough to vote. That's one of the arguments uh, that was used against it. Others said that women were too pure and wholesome to be sullied by the dark arts of politics. In 1896, the legislature did agree to put a suffrage measure on the ballot. And national suffrage leaders like Susan B. Anthony came to California to help with the campaign. and. That's 1911. Go back. There you go. No, go back one more. There you go. Thank you. And, uh, and Susan B. Anthony actually, she was in her 70s back then, and she would go up and down the state of California uh, giving speeches, sometimes three speeches a day. Um, ultimately, the measure lost by 26,000 votes. The scales were tipped by a last minute barrage by the liquor industry which was afraid that if women got the vote, they would vote for prohibition. So the industry flooded bars and restaurants and hotels up and down the state with warnings, especially in San Francisco, which seemed to have a tavern on every street corner. And that warning was, this could be your last beer, vote no on suffrage. And in fact, San Francisco voted three to one against suffrage in 1896. During the next 15 years, a handful of women refused to give up, still trying to sponsor legislation. Uh, but they made no headway. One attempt after another was shot down by the all-male legislature. Now, once a candidate for governor uh, actually promised face-to-face -face a suffrage leader that if, he's, if he was elected uh, governor, she would have a friend in the, in the governor's office, and he would, in fact, support suffrage. But once he got into office, he reneged on that and said, I was only joking. In fact, I think women belong at home with the kids. In 1911, progressive Republicans, who then controlled the legislature and had taken over control after the 1910 elections, put another suffrage measure on a special election ballot. The campaign slogan was, give your girl an equal chance with your boy. And the campaign tried to reach voters in every town and hamlet in California with at least 200 persons. Suffragist Selena Solomons wrote the only detailed first-person account of that campaign. She had come from a prominent, wealthy family in San Francisco, but she connected with young working women and understood that one of the failures of that 1896 campaign was white elitism that kept secretaries and shop girls and clerks and cannery workers outside the suffrage campaign. She brought them in and those women became articulate advocates for the suffrage cause. In her book, Solomons talked about her utter despair on election night, when the vote count showed suffrage was losing by a pretty big margin. Dejected and upset, she left a vote watch party before midnight and started walking aimlessly along Market Street in San Francisco. She was taunted by some young men who said, you're never going to get the vote. And she said to herself, they're probably right. But two days later, two full days later, votes started trickling in from those rural areas and small hamlets, from ranchers and farmers and miners in the rural areas and from Southern California, which generally was ignored previously. The suffrage leaders had learned from their mistakes in 1896, and whereas 36 counties had voted against suffrage that year, 
Only eight said no in 1911. And by about 3,500 votes, extremely close election, California became the sixth and largest state to give women the vote. And in San Francisco, which was still controlled a lot by the liquor interests, suffered still lost, but, but by a much smaller margin than in 1896. So the California vote really was, as it is today in many cases, a trendsetter. In the ensuing seven years, nine other states, including some big states like New York and Michigan, followed California's lead and adopted many of its campaign strategies to give women the vote. One of the ongoing, and I find this fascinating, one of the ongoing arguments against suffrage, and the LA Times and, and others uh, espoused this, was that women really didn't want the vote. And that was, again, one of their major arguments. Well, two months after the election, in December of 1911, came their first big test, municipal elections in the city of Los Angeles. 70,000 women stood in long lines to register to vote, and 65,000 of them actually cast ballots. And seven years after that, 1918, a little over 100 years ago, the first four women were elected to the state assembly after defeating male opponents. One male candidate said women were simply too weak for the job, but Elizabeth Hughes trounced him at the polls. The women quickly made their mark on issues such as criminal justice reform, gender equality, water and irrigation, and education. But that electoral success could not be sustained. In fact, in the next 56 years, only 10 other women were elected to the state assembly, and none, of course, in, uh, to the uh, Senate. So women had to find other ways to affect public policy. Some used the courts, such as Felicitas Mendez, who sued an Orange County school district in 1946 when it prevented her children from attending their neighborhood school and instead sent them to a, quote, Mexican-American school that happened to be located right adjacent to a smelly dairy and separated from that dairy by an electrified fence. She and her husband won that case, which led to the desegregation of California schools, years before the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision that struck down the concept of separate but equal in schools nationwide. At the same time, Leon Baxter, here on the left, along with her husband, Clem Whitaker, were establishing themselves as the nation's foremost political consulting experts, getting governors elected and dozens of public policy measures either defeated or, or <coughs> successful at the ballot box. In fact, for a number of years, they held a complete monopoly as the country's only professional political consultants. And you can get a great picture of how they built their formidable reputation by going through their papers here at the archives, which we did. As a matter of fact, we spent so much time here at the archives going through uh, collections, oral histories, vote records going back to 1912. We used to joke with Nancy and uh, Melody Anderson, who was here, that we ought to just get a cot and move on in. In 1933, they devised a brilliant media strategy to defeat the heavily funded PG&E and ensure enactment of the Central Valley Project to bring water to valley farmers. The following year, calling themselves Campaigns, Inc., they invented modern hardball politics to savage Upton Sinclair's campaign for governor. That was, that was in 1934. Whitaker's forte was long-term strategy. Baxter's was devising campaign tactics to support that strategy. At one point in the mid-1900s, they had won 55 out of 60 separate campaigns everything from electing Earl Warren governor to defeating universal health care. In 1946, they ran a brilliant campaign against the recall of San Francisco Mayor Roger Lapham, who was in trouble for raising taxes and boosting streetcar fares. If the recall succeeded, the Board of Supervisors would appoint a successor, a new mayor. Drawing on a tablecloth one day, Baxter sketched a picture, a picture of a sinister fat man wearing a fancy suit chomping on a big cigar with a tilted derby hat hiding his face. And she gave him the name The Faceless Man, representing a fictitious puppet boss who was pushing the recall in the hopes that he would be named mayor. The so-called Faceless Man was plastered on billboards, newspaper ads, pamphlets, and featured in press releases and radio spots. Uh, one journalist noted 
that San Franciscans would have lynched this faceless brute if only they could have gotten their hands on him. Baxter's strategy worked, of course. Uh, she and her husband had successfully adapted public relations to politics and became as powerful, perhaps more powerful, than the people they elected. Like Leon Baxter, Elizabeth Snyder never ran for office, but she was a hard-charging, pioneering Democratic activist. In fact, in 1954, she became the first woman in the nation elected chair of a state political party. The good old boys' network was slowly breaking down, and many of her papers and Democratic Party documents are housed here at state archives. Snyder's job, of course, was to get more Democrats elected statewide to Congress and to the legislature. But for decades, Democrats had chafed under old political rules which, uh, in which candidates were allowed to run in multiple primaries at the same time, and it was called cross-filing. Uh, all, all along, while appearing on the ballot without their political affiliations listed. So you just had a bunch of names. You didn't know if they were Democrats or Republicans, and Republicans could run in Democratic primaries and vice versa. Well, starting in the mid-30s, during the depths of the Depression, the number of Democrats had overtaken Republicans. But Republicans kept winning these elections under this system of cross-filing. So Snyder was convinced that many Democrats simply were unwittingly voting for conservatives. They didn't know who they were voting for. That's why they were winning. First, she tirelessly uh, worked to convince voters to allow political affiliations to be listed on the ballot. And since you now had more Democrats than Republicans, that was helping Democrats win some more elections. Then she helped Pat Brown become only the second Democratic governor of the 20th century. And she was an architect of the Democratic campaign to retake control of the legislature for the first time in 80 years. Once in the majority, Democrats quickly passed a bill ending cross-filing, and Elizabeth Snyder's legacy was cemented. The one thing Snyder couldn't accomplish, however, was getting more women to win elections. And that's where Jeff will pick up the story. Um, so, so I'm the boy named Sue speaking to you here. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Sue could, Susie couldn't be here, but uh, uh, she, I do want to preliminarily say uh, it's too bad she's not here. She was the lead researcher for both books and uh, carried a really heavy load for for coming up with the the arcane details that really actually transformed some of the storytelling that we had in the book. So very sorry that that Susie can't be here. So after uh, Liz Snyder, uh, uh, well, around the same, same turn, right around the 1950s, uh, while many uh, people like Snyder and, and Leona Baxter were making their mark as campaign operatives, uh, very few were winning elections in California. In fact, very few women uh, even ran for office in the 1950s. Now, as depicted in the TV sitcoms of those days when I was growing up anyway, women were expected to stay home and take care of the kids and take advantage of all those uh, New, new products and new, uh, new, newfangled uh, appliances that you could get, like a refrigerator. I know when I was growing up, we started off with an ice box, but they, they had blenders and things like that. And so that, that was uh, essentially where women were supposed to be. But it, there was another possible reason why, why women didn't run in the 50s too much. They, they, there, there were, uh, there was, the flogging of a candidate named Helen Gehagen Douglas, who ran for the United States Senate against uh, Richard Nixon uh, in 1950. She was the victim of a really dirty campaign tricks, like the time she was doused with water and uh, pelted with hay during a rally, one of her own rallies at USC, or a speech at USC. Nixon, who, uh, well, in addition to the conservative uh, uh, candidate, Richard Nixon at the time, uh, the LA Times 
at that, during that period in history, it was a very conservative newspaper and one of the strongest voices in California on all public policy, but very conservative. And they, along with others, accused Douglas of being a communist sympathizer. Nixon said she was pink right down to her underwear. And whether by coincidence or not, the number of women in California running for Congress or the legislature dropped dramatically for more than a decade uh, following that. And, and it's my view anyway that that, that was a very a singular, one of, the, one of the main reasons why. The women's movement did re receive a huge boost in 1960 with, of all things, the government's approval of birth control pills. So well, how can that be? Well, that enabled women to postpone childbearing while offering them opportunities to attend college, enter the workforce, and run for public office it, in, in, uh, in ways that freed them up uh, from the pressures of, of raising a family. 1962 was a breakthrough year when March Fong Yu, or March Fong, who later be married and became March Fong Yu, she became the first Asian American woman elected in the legislature. That was 1966. And as you can see in this uh, uh, photograph, she very early on latched onto a wonderful public relations gimmick to support her bill banning pay toilets in, in public uh, buildings. That was well before your time for m most of you here. But back then in many public buildings, you had to put a dime into a, a little, a little uh, knob uh, to open the toilet and it only existed in the women's rooms. It really wasn't in men's rooms. Um, March Fong went on, as March Fong Yu, went on to become California's first female Secretary of State. Uh, also in 1966, the same year, uh, California uh, broke uh, another barrier uh, when Yvonne Brathwaite became the first African American elected to the legislature. She went on to Congress and then enjoyed a long career uh, uh, as a Los Angeles County Supervisor. Now, in our research, or in Susie's research, uh, she did come across a San Francisco Examiner headline they called these two new women, quote, beautiful and brainy. And it, the kind of story that you wouldn't see nowadays, it didn't deal with their qualifications or their platform or their political strategy at all. It emphasized their hairdos and their fashion choices and the articles ran in the women's sections of the newspapers, not out on the political pages. Uh, California didn't have a woman state senator until Roseanne Vuich in 1976, and as you recall, it was 1918 when they, the first four went to the state assembly. But it wasn't until 76, that's 126 years after statehood, uh, that, they, the, that Roseanne Vuich became the first senator. When a male member would stand and, uh, on the floor and, and probably out of habit more than anything else, refer to gentlemen of the Senate, uh, she would ring this little porcelain bell uh, that she kept on her, her desk on the Senate floor to remind everybody that, uh, that, that she was there. The Senate was so unprepared for her arrival, in fact, that uh, they didn't have a women's room in the immediate vicinity of the, uh, of the Senate chamber, so they installed one, and today it's dedicated in her honor as the Rose Room. Now, not until 1979 did a woman had the party, uh, a party caucus in the legislature either. Now this is Republican uh, Carol Hallett who flew her own plane. Uh, she was a pilot and would fly her plane from San Luis Obispo to Sacramento for, for sessions. And uh, at one point she astutely engineered uh, the ouster of a veteran male uh, colleague as the assembly Republican leader. The 90s brought uh, more women running for office and, and uh, for the first time in the 140 year history of the state, a woman was selected by a major party to run for governor, uh, to be the party's candidate for governor. Now, while Dianne Feinstein did not win in 1990, she lost to Pete Wilson, uh, she and Barbara Boxer both won Senate seats in 1992 that, that first year of the woman that uh, Steve referred to earlier. Uh, 
uh, and became the first, California became the first state represented by two women in, in, uh, in the United States Senate. Being a little redundant there. 92 also saw some major gains in the legislature as well as in the state's congressional delegation. Uh, thanks to term limits, the additional help of term limits and redistricting, women picked up six seats in the legislature at that time, the largest increase in the state's history. And that same was true in the state's congressional de delegation where uh, female representation jumped from three to seven. Um, now, in last November's election, as, uh, many women, of course, were motivated by the Me Too movement to, to become more politically active and actually run for office amid concerns that uh, President Trump and the courts might reverse some of the public policy gains that women had made over the years, from reproductive rights to equality in the workplace. Um, for the first time in California, uh, we have three female statewide office, office holds, constitutional officers serving simultaneously, including the state's first lieutenant governor, Eleni uh, Kunalakis, uh, Eleni Sokopoulos before she was married from Sacramento. Women now comprise 30% of the legislature, and, and, and the legislature is more racially diverse than ever before. Better, reflect, better reflecting the state's demo, demogra, demographics. Blah, blah. But in their march uh, toward political un parity, women still face a number of object, uh, obstacles. Um, after term limits were imposed in 1990, women started gaining significant strength in the legislature. Those numbers started mar moving up significantly. One important consequence was that term limits forced entrenched lawmakers, male law lawmakers, some of whom had been in dec office for decades, they had to move on. And as we know from our history that the easiest path for women and even other, any challenger, is to take on, uh, take a, to, to run for office in a, an open seat uh, that doesn't have an incumbent. So women were able to make gains there. But a recent change in the law allows legislatures, we changed the term limits law, as voters did, to allow uh, people to say, stay in office up to 12 years in either house of the legislature. Now because of that, in the assembly for example, there's not a single member from, who will be forced out of office by term limits between now and, and 2024. So, or maybe even later uh, in some cases. So making it more difficult for women to increase their numbers. So it is a hurdle. Now there'll be some maybe who uh, move on to other offices and stuff, but um, uh, you know, some members of the legislature may move on to higher office. So there will be some openings, but there's no, gu no guarantees before uh, 2024. Here's another issue. Last November, there wasn't so much a pink wave as a democratic pink wave. Um, California's partly, that's partly California's political demographics. Democratic win women did, did very well in the election. Republican women, not so much. In fact, while six Democratic women were ousting Republicans in the legislature and Congress, two of those incumbent women were Republicans, were women, excuse me. Two of the incumbents that were ousted were women. So there are no longer any Republican women in the California congressional delegation. And there are only five Republican women combined in both the state, Senate, and the assembly. So to achieve parity, women of both parties must find ways to win. And as former GOP Senator Kelly Ayotte says, re Republican women have to step up their game. So without the dozens of women pioneers and activists, many of them identified in our book, who battled the odds and took political risks, California wouldn't be what it is today. Women have been making a difference paving the way, if you will, since statehood, becoming role models for future generations of, of leaders in California. And uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions, but that's, that's you know, the quick, uh, there's 156 years, or 176 years now, I guess, in, in, uh, in quick order. So any questions, we're happy to answer about either. We've got lots of stories about 
people you've never heard of, and that's and, and, one of the things that. And, uh, and about the research, about the contents of the book, do you think? Yeah. Once they got the vote, how did Bloomington to join the How did they vote? Do you have an idea? Yeah. Um, well, let me tell you um, that, that, that is interesting because in a number of uh, areas there were prohibition votes and the women were split on it. Sometimes they voted for it, a lot of them did, but a lot of times they did not and they, they were pretty discerning. There was one election that, was, that would have uh, made it very, very difficult you know, for, for anybody to get any alcohol at all and, uh, and they thought it was too stringent and so the women's vote did not go, go for that. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, what is interesting is that they, you know, it took seven years before they put another woman in, into office. And then once they were elected, these women did some amazing things. I mean, they specialized in education. One, one of these first four women was from Oroville, and she was, she was responsible for making Chico State, basically, and funding Chico State, and small, and small rural districts. I mean, she was, that was her baby. Uh, bringing water to the Central Valley. Uh, Esto Broughton, I just want to mention her name. She, she was a young woman, uh, grew up in Turlock, and as a child she had spinal tuberculosis and her growth was stunted, stunted at four foot six. And she was told basically you'd never be able to do anything. Well, she learned to ride a motorcycle. She got into the Cal. She uh, took courses on law. She was a, a, a member of her class crew. She came, came out of Cal as a lawyer, and she, as a member of the legislature, she was responsible for getting water to the Central Valley, and she, she made irrigation and, and, and water policy her, her specialty. Another uh, great woman, Anna Saylor, she grew up in extreme poverty in the Midwest, uh, comes to California, the family settles in Berkeley, and she gets elected thanks to the, the local women's club in Berkeley, and she became an amazing advocate for criminal justice reform. Right after she was elected, but before she was sworn in, she went to San Quentin. You had women in San Quentin with the men. Uh, you know, they, you had uh, little children as, as young as eight going to county jails with hardened criminals. And she made sure that A, uh, she got rid of the death penalty for minors, and also separated the children from the hardened criminals once she got into office. And, and her career took off. That was fascinating. Um, so, women's uh, sponsored uh, measures on gender equality, you know, things like that. But also, some really difficult, uh, difficult issues. I, I would add that there were some uh, structural reasons, but Republicans did maintain pretty much control of, the, you know, of the first half of the century. Uh, in California, c c control of the legislature. And women were a sizable portion of the vote at that time, too. So women voters uh, probably, uh, you know, were split. You know, there were, there were progressive, some were more conservative. It was interesting, though, that the, the, the policy developments that happened during the time that our book spans uh, tended to be on the progressive side, environmental, the environmental movement, uh, the, smog, the smog ladies in Los Angeles, um, the, the, the uh, women's clubs that did the yeah. uh, environment, uh, the, um, Cal, the conservation, Calvary, conservation, Calvary's big trees, the redwoods up on the north coast, um, all kinds of progressive movements uh, were, were yeah. being led by women at the time. Um, so, so, and it's interesting because the kinds of things that would spark a story in a book are the successes of those women. And those were progressive movements by and large because it was challenging the status quo. And so there were, there, by its very nature, those kinds of things are gonna be a progressive kind of. And I, I just might wanna add, one of the interesting things that I learned in researching and, and working on this book is that generally when we think of uh, public policy makers, we think of individuals who are closest to the levers of power, elected officials. But there were so many women who couldn't get into that, those corridors of power, made such a huge difference. Going back to the gold rush for those, the first 60 years, you know, before they could even vote. I mean, again, forming women's clubs, 
and saving large swaths, large growths of 2,000-year-old redwoods from loggers. I mean, women did that in 1900, in the early 1900s, before they even had the vote. Uh, women in Los Angeles, uh, in the Friday Morning Club in Los Angeles, uh, decided we're going to find out why there is so much tainted milk and why, why the milk is tainted in, in, in Southern California uh, that is uh, harming and killing toddlers and infants. And they traced it to a number of dairies that had cows with tuberculosis. So they forced government to increase oversight on the dairies. Uh, women in San Francisco and in Oakland, after the 1906 earthquake, helped rid those communities of rats, of rat infestations. I mean, they, they worked so hard. They, they allied themselves with the progressive Republicans who were coming to office in 1910, uh, and they supported their efforts to help rid San Francisco and Los Angeles of corruption in politics. I mean, it just it goes on and on and on uh, what these women could accomplish even though they had no political standing. And that's what was so really so inspiring. And even before that, we talk about, I mean, we have stories about, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I, I just, I think it's, these are good stories. Uh, women who, who, um, who fought for, for jobs in the, mark, in, the, in, the work, in the working place that they were not open to, her, to them before. In 1878, a woman by the name of Clara Foltz, who nobody's heard of, and she's not in any history books. But in 1878, she is abandoned by her husband in San Jose. She has five kids, age two to nine. How is she going to make a living? And how is she going to feed her kids? She takes in sewing. And she, you know, she makes a few bucks, but that barely feeds her kids. She wants to be a lawyer. State law says women can't be lawyers. So she writes a law that says women can be lawyers takes it to a state senator and says, will you, will, you, will you carry this bill for me? He says, yes. She becomes a lobbyist for this legislation. And as she told it later on in her memoir, she, she would beg and plead for votes. I'd get down on my knees if it would help to get a vote. And she finally got enough votes to get this bill out. Sounds great, right? But she had a governor named William Irwin who hadn't decided what he was going to do with this legislation. And so, there was a midnight deadline for him to either sign bills or veto bills. And he hadn't, up until that midnight deadline, nobody knew what he was going to do. So Clara Foltz is standing outside the governor's office with a bunch of other lobbyists waiting for word on, on bills. And a man comes through the inner office and says, the lady lawyer bill is dead. So she is absolutely devastated and angry. When the guard is not watching, she slips past the guard into the governor's ante room, keeps on going into the governor's internal off, uh, private office. And there he is with the attorney general and an aide signing bills and vetoing bills. And meanwhile, it's getting close to midnight. And she confronts the governor. And the governor says, basically, who are you? What are you doing here? And she's trembling. And she's really nervous. She says, governor, you have to sign the lady lawyer bill. The governor turns to an aide and says, well, where is that bill? Aid points to the veto pile. It's in there. He fishes it out. He looks at it. He reads it. Looks up at her and says, you know, this is a good bill. I'm going to sign it. And he did. And according to Clara Foltz in her memoirs later, just as he signed the bill, now maybe she was taking some journalistic license, just as he signed the bill, the clock struck 12. <laughs> so then she wants to go to the Hastings School of Law, which had just opened up, uh, because she thought, you didn't have to go to law school back then to become a lawyer. Um, but she wanted that education to help her clients. She, she and a friend, Laura DeForce Gordon of Lodi, they go, they both of them go, they plunk down their $10 tuition. And they take, right, everybody's laughing. And they, uh, they take classes for a couple days, and all of a sudden they are physically picked up and escorted out of the building. Hastings doesn't allow women. So they decided to do what every good lawyer does, and they filed a lawsuit. It went all the way up to the state Supreme Court, and they won. So here this woman, Clara Foltz, abandoned by her husband, uh, left to fend for herself with five young kids, you know, uh, writes a law and gets it passed that allows women to become lawyers and to attend the University of California's law school at Hastings. She went on to become the first lawyer, female lawyer in California, the first deputy DA, female deputy DA in the nation. And she created this, the concept of the parole system and the public defender. 
And what surprised me and what's kind of angering is that nobody's ever heard of her. You can't, it's hard to find information on her. I mean, especially in, in the history books. And that's just, again, I went off on a tangent and there are many others, but that's just one of those stories that, uh, that, that really mean a lot to me that, from our research. Another question. I filibustered, I'm sorry. Yeah. Clara Foltz, F-O-L-T-Z. Now, with the newfangled uh, machines we have now, you can find her on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I challenge you to find her in a, in a history book. You mentioned that the state legislature uh, early on, uh, male dominated legislature, put up a lot of resistance to suffrage. Yes. Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure of the of the role of academia. Um, it's a good I, I don't. Right? I, I don't know. Uh, we're, I, I'm not sure. At least in the late 1800s, how many women were actually going if academia? If you mean college level, right. as opposed to high school, I'm not sure there were that many women in going to college at the time. So, yeah. so I, I would. My, be my guess that there, there, there wasn't a lot of active movement coming out of the university system to support it. I mean, especially on the on the on the male side. I mean, um, you know, suffrage really d didn't pick up steam until the very end, and when it, and it was a the whole new uh, crew of uh, progressives, you know, that that swept into office with Hiram Johnson in 1910 primarily to get rid of the undue influence of the railroad, Southern Pacific Railroad. And again, in 1910, they put 23 measures, separate constitutional amendments on the 1911 special election ballot, including the initiative, the referendum, the recall, uh, regulations against the railroad, uh, wor better working conditions for women and children. And one of those measures, the one that passed with the least amount of gap, I mean, the, the toughest one, was women's suffrage. There's a question over here. When did women start teaching on the higher, higher education level, so the college level, and law that some are still coming in the age? Yeah, uh, you know, that, it's, it's tough. You know, I go through, I, I went through reading uh, a lot of University of California yearbooks back, you know, from, from the old days. And you, there weren't women on the faculty at all. And there were very, again, especially in the 1800s, very few uh, who, you know, were admitted to the school. I mean, there were a handful in the 1880s. There were some. Um, and, uh, and they, you know, a lot of them became, you know, real leaders. Uh, one of them, Mary McHenry Keith, became a leader in the suffrage movement. Uh, and she held the suffrage movement together between 1896, that debacle, and 1911. And she headed up the, the, um, the suffrage club in Berkeley. And she went to school in Berkeley. As a matter of fact, uh, I think she went to, this, went to school uh, the same time that, um, that Hiram Johnson uh, was, was, at, was at Cal. Can I tell you one Hiram Johnson story? Uh, it, is, it has nothing to do with this topic, but, but it's in our first book, and it's just my, one of my favorite stories. Hiram Johnson went to, went, was at Berkeley, and in 18, 1887, in a yearbook, I'm reading it in a Cal yearbook, he was the captain of the baseball team, the, the, soft, the sophomore baseball team in 1887. And he was, a, he was on the debate club and things like that. And so I'm, I'm checking all these Cal yearbooks, and I see him mentioned, uh, discussed in 1886 and 1887, but 1888 yearbook, he's not in it. And the 1889 yearbook, he's not in it uh, at all. And that's when he was supposed to graduate. And I'm thinking, what happened to Hiram Johnson? You always hear, okay, he went to Cal, okay. But, so I, I, I obsessed over this in our first book for I, how long? I probably you know, uh, kept it from publication on time <laughs> because I, I had to find out what happened. Well, I finally found it. He quit the university after his sophomore year to marry his pregnant girlfriend. Now, 1887, that was the days before Twitter and social media. Can you imagine uh, what that would have been like and would have ruined his political career, probably, uh, had that gotten out? But back then, without the media that you have now, it was just uh, forgotten and nobody knew about it. 
I just found that interesting. And he obviously went on to become um, perhaps our greatest governor. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there weren't a lot in the, in the legislature back then. Um, you know, as we mentioned, the f 1918 was the first. We did elect in, 19, in 1923 first, and then 1925, first women to Congress. And uh, so they started serving in Congress. What, there was a huge contribution made by a woman by the name of Florence Kahn. And she uh, was elected to, to serve, well, her husband was Julius Kahn, was a member of Congress, and he died after becoming, a, after he was elected, but before he was sworn in. And she took uh, his place and then was reelected five times. And she was amazing because um, she was a, a, I think today some people would call her a tough broad. I mean, she was just no nonsense, right? And so, she was the first woman ever to be placed on the Military Affairs Committee and the first woman on the Appropriations Committee, both very powerful. And she was from San Francisco, and she was the one who, um, who found the money for the San Francisco Bay Bridge and for um, uh, uh, Naval Air Station in Alameda and the, the war effort, uh, you know, that was to, to come. So she made a huge contribution in Congress. Well, what we did find was, though, that uh, much of the, the development of policy and public, public perception was really out of the legislature. The, the women's contributions during that period were, were citi was citizen contributions right. and you know, citi citizen activism, so uh, less, less than in the legislature. Right. Uh, and there were many years in the legislature where there was only one woman serving for maybe 10 years or so, and up, in, up until the 60s, and through the, some of the 60s. Yeah. yeah. Did the dynamics of the legislature change significantly in California after the women began the right to vote? Um, to some extent. I mean, um, as I mentioned earlier, after those, you know, the, those first four legislators, women were elected in 1918, it took, uh, in the next 56 years, only 10 other women were elected to the assembly. And again, there were various, various reasons. I mean, in, in the 30s, during the Depression, uh, it was thought that women shouldn't take men's jobs, and you know, it was, politics were for men. In the 40s, women should be working in defense plants if they're gonna work at all uh, during the war. In the 50s, as, as uh, Jeff mentioned, there were various, you know, women were supposed to be at home uh, and also you had that other dynamic with, um, with Helen Gahagan Douglas. Um, you know, so you, I mean, you did have women, a few women, but it, it really wasn't a lot, and it wasn't until the 60s. And once you had women you know, coming into the legislature, um, what changed a lot, I think, were the, some, of the, some of the issues that got discussed and passed, because women bring a different perspective than men, and they have a different sort of attitude. Uh, for example, one of our interviews was with Patricia Bates, who at that time was the Senate uh, Republican leader uh, a couple years ago. And she, she says, and others have, and studies have sort of confirmed this, that women seek compromise more than men and consensus. And whereas you may have an issue that is sort of getting stuck in the legislature, uh, you know, men want to just vote on it right now, but women want to keep at it until we can get, you know, get this thing fully baked, you know, and become legislation. So there's some, cha you know, differences that way. And a lot of issues, we found a lot of issues that were basically ignored. A lot of them dealing with education and children and things like, and the family, those were taken up by women. S starting in the 20s and the 30s and all the way through. And so, um, you know, it only makes sense to have these different perspectives in our in our elected bodies. Yes. Kind of going off of that, thinking about the fact that there weren't a lot of necessarily women in those elected positions, but that they were effective as citizen leaders and, and organizing groups. So was it 
I think it was a little, mm -hmm. a little of all of the above, I, I think, is part of it. it. If you think about it in, in the uh, uh, in the case of the, the redwoods and the Calaveras big trees, women took up a cause against essentially uh, guys with big saws and 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 lumber mills and stuff and and uh, so so it wasn't it was more <coughs> sensitizing people and the, and the smog ladies in Los Angeles the, the who were uh, you know very well to do many of them were like wives of of Broadway I mean Hollywood. Producers and, yes, and yeah. smog, like smog ladies, we call them the smog ladies. You probably never heard of the smog ladies or stamp out smog. And I grew up in Los Angeles and I never heard about them. But these were women that started with nine women, just nine women in Beverly Hills whose husbands were, uh, were in, the, in the entertainment industry. And they had small kids. And the small kids couldn't go to school because the smog was so bad in the 1950s and factories would close down. Schools would close down sometimes. There's one woman, Margaret Levy, had to take her, her uh, two-year-old daughter to a, a hospital because she was having trouble breathing. And the doctor said, you need to move out of Los Angeles uh, because it's not healthy. And she decided, no, I'm not gonna move out of LA. I'm gonna stay here and fight. And the very first smog alert in, Cal in Los Angeles was in 1943. Between 43 and 58, not much was done at all on smog. So what they did is that they formed this group starting with nine women uh, working out of a living room in Beverly Hills and they started different tactics, rallies, protests. They put uh, their kids in gas masks to get all this media attention and they got it. They got tons, the media loved this stuff, right? And they had these Hollywood connections. Um, they, they sponsored a, a share a ride day to try to get people to, to, uh, to carpool. Well, you know, they got Lucille Ball uh, and Paramount Studios to do public service announcements. I mean, they had connections. And because they had these connections, they also had the ear of some legislators and of Governor Pat Brown. And so it is so interesting, at a PTA meeting w once, back in the, in the 60s, uh, one of these women uh, was asked at a PTA meeting, well, sure, sure, smog is bad, but what can a bunch of women do? Well, these women grew their organization from nine individual people to a, an organization that had nearly 500 other organizations as coalition partners representing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people. So that whenever there was a bill in, in the legislature or a measure coming up in, in, in LA County on smog, on catalytic converters or on, on um, fuel, con, fuel composition or things like that, they would get on the phone, they didn't have smartphones back then, but they get on the phone and get everybody to write a letter to your legislator and write a letter to the governor, and they were given credit for uh, helping to create 150 separate pieces of legislation dealing with smog. Now, smog in LA is still bad, but anybody who's from LA knows it's a lot better now than it was in the 50s and the 60s. And yet, again, these women, you can't find them in history books. They're lost, they're basically lost to history. And we just wanted to bring them alive. But these women it did have different tactics. If you look back, I'll just give you a, talking about tactics. On one of the, the boards back there, you'll see a picture of women sitting in a 1910 Packard touring car. It was called the Blue Liner. They brought that car from Washington State to California for the 1911 suffrage fight. Why would you bring that car to, you know, for a suffrage fight? Well, first of all, they would drive their suffragists out to small communities in that car and give little speeches. But the big reason is they would drive that car into San Francisco. Now, if they put out a flyer saying, suffrage speech today, all you men are welcome, how many people do you think you'd get? They didn't, men didn't seem to care, right? But they would park that car on a busy street corner in downtown San Francisco and then wait for the men to come by and, and admire the upholstery or look under the hood or kick the tires. Wow, this is, a, this is the fanciest car I've ever seen. And once you had a big crowd of men around there, they'd pop up and give them a speech on suffrage. <laughs> so you're talking about tactic. That's a great tactic, isn't it? Anyway. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, you, do you want me to start yeah, off? Or? Yeah, yeah. Pauline, uh, Pauline Davis was a, an assemblywoman, first elected in 1952, representing the far north part of California, uh, Plumas County and several other counties. And in our research, uh, we knew she occupied a, an important place in California history because for many years she was the only woman in the legislature by, all by herself. And she was a no-nonsense uh, legislator. And she took her district very seriously, and that's what she cared about. And water was so important up there. And so uh, when we decided we wanted to write about Pauline Davis, one, I interviewed her son, Rodney Davis, who was uh, a famous judge in, in, in California. Um, but also he had some great stories about when she was back in the 50s and he was three and four years old and go on, on uh, tours with her in, up in the district and things like that. But um, we found the Paul, you know, Pauline Davis you know, papers here and some legislative papers here. And that helps round out your story. I mean, you know, our book is about storytelling. So we're not, we're not a textbook. And so we don't want to just say Pauline Davis came here in 1952 and she was reelected, you know, and she served so many times and she, you know, spent 24 years. And yes, she was famous for, you know, helping her district. You need flavor. And you get flavor by, by doing your research and finding, you know, even boring stuff, uh, what seems to be boring, you know, reading an oral history or something like that. But uh, it just helps enrich the story. And in terms of Pauline Davis, Pauline Davis was really powerful because she was the one who forced legislation to help her district. And a lot of times guys would give her, you know, give her grudging uh, credit because they didn't like the idea that, uh, you know, a woman or anybody was telling them what to do. But she would, you know, before she would give a vote, for example, on the state water plan, before she would, you know, give a vote to Pat Brown, she had to get these lakes in her, they were called Pauline's Puddles, lakes up in her, her district and things like that. And so she was a very st extremely strong leader. And again, it was the research, a lot of the research here uh, where you can see uh, some of her correspondence. I mean, and, you know, you think, you know, just maybe, uh, you know, maybe just a letter to somebody may not be that interesting, but it is if it's put into context, and it's different than, it's nothing that you would find in, in, a, in a history book. So, you know, research here, the State Library, Bancroft Library in Berkeley, I mean, all these collections really help in, in, uh, bring these people to life. You, you know, you do find facts, and the, the stories are, are essential for, the, for these books. But you also find interesting nuggets that are on sheets of paper in a file that you've never, mm -hmm. that nobody has probably opened in years. Uh, when Earl Warren ran, uh, was state attorney general, he was one of the strongest advocates in the nation for internment of Japanese uh, uh, during the war, at the beginning of the war, and. Um, as a result, partly of his efforts, but the, you know there was a public tide as well. But he was out there flogging that tide, and so uh, during that period of time, 90,000 people from California, 100, 110, 120 overall around the country, but 90,000 of them from California were interned. And uh, we here, right, right in this room, when we were going through some old files. Uh, about that period, uh, came across this letter in, in, in the first book. And uh, it was from J J Japanese organizations in the Bay Area attesting to how wonderful Earl Warren was. This was, they, they were endorsement letters for his election as Attorney General. And, and he, he would never do it to other Japanese. He would never do anything to harm the Japanese. He would, he's always been fair to us. He would never do anything that would be, not be in our interest. And it was just on a, on a, a it was actually a, 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 oh, a copy um, of, of somebody else's letter. I mean, of, of the original, just, you know, the backing copy. So, yeah, and the other, th other thing I'd mention is, um, is going through the Whitaker and Baxter collection here in, 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 the, in the archives is fascinating. I mean, several boxes and just, you really get a great picture 
of what uh, these two individuals uh, were able to accomplish, and and uh, you know the copy of the, of the ad material that they created, and, and even just looking at their 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 list of of uh, supporters and how much money they gave in a, in a campaign. I mean, down to the a quarter. It'll it'll say, well, is this person you know gave a quarter or something like that. I mean, just. It's, it's technical information, but if you can put it into context, it sort of becomes part of the larger story. And so this, this research is just is, is fascinating. I really thank the archives and everything they've done. One other thing I'll point to, on this, those shelves over there and those, those blue bound uh, books, those are oral histories. And you might think, you know, okay, so why do I want to read an oral history? Well, what is so great about the oral history program uh, and they have a, you know, one here at, at the archives, but also University of California at Berkeley has had one for many years. Uh, they are interviewing uh, newsmakers, people who did things, at a time after they were in office, so they can let their hair down and actually tell the truth and not spin. And the, some of the stories you read are fascinating that have never seen the light of day. And that's where we get a lot of our story material uh, from those oral histories. And so, uh, as I was mentioning at the outset, right after Nancy uh, invited us, we would spend hours and hours and hours here reading those oral histories and going through the collections and going, and we studied every single, we went back and studied every single election from 1912 on. How many women ran? How many women won? What was the vote? you know, it, all of that stuff. And so they also have back there a collection of all the vote, votes going back to 1912. And so, I mean, you could live here and write a lot of books. Well, you did. Yeah, we did, <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, that prompts my next question is, what's the next topic? <laughs> I'm a very, very old man. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's a lot of work. It is uh, a lot of work. The re it? For me, the research was the most fun. I, absolutely, I really yeah. do. Because I'm, every time I go through one of these collections or whatever, I'm discovering something new and something I never thought of before. So for me, research is the most fun. Writing is second. Marketing is the last. <laughs> um, so yeah. if you write another book, you have to at least do the marketing. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, uh, the other thing, too, is that it did take us a while to figure out what we, after the last one, what we would be our, <clears throat> our next book. We, we thought at first it was like, let's go have a drink and yeah. <laughs> isn't it great? We've got our book done. And then we would talk, okay, well, wait a minute. Now we've got the background and let's try another book. And so I, I, should tell you, I, I should tell you how our first book started. That was the Game Changers book, 12 Elections That Transformed California. We've been friends, the four of us and our spouses, uh, friends for eons. I mean, when I first came to Sacramento from Los Angeles, like in 1969, and Jeff was, you know, young, we were all young, and we were rookie reporters together, and so we've known each other for many years, and we were on vacation together in uh, Seattle, and we're sitting around a dinner table, and Susie, my wife, who worked for 35 years at the Capitol, says, do you realize, and this was kind of ego deflating, do you realize if you add up all the years together that the four of us have either covered the Capitol or worked inside the Capitol, it's like 150 years. <laughs> that made us feel really old. <laughs> and so she said, we ought to write a book on that. And then we thought, well, you know, we're sort of heading into semi-retirement. Well, let's, let's do that. That'd be kind of a fun project. And then it became a very all-consuming project, um, which is why there may not be a next one. <laughs> but uh, it's 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 been fun. Yes. You mean where to find them, or? Yeah. Oh gosh. Because you mentioned one earlier and it sounded pretty. Oh, uh, Clara Foltz? Yeah. Well, here, yeah. Clara Foltz, uh, her memoir was serialized in a newspaper that she owned in San Diego. I mean, she did everything. And she, but so she owns this newspaper and she basically serializes her life in it. And um, that's where I, you know, and I, I found it. I found that, uh, I found that online somewhere. 
Yeah, it, but it was hard to find. Some of it you do literally stumble across. Yeah, and, and that's where you, you start again. We didn't know where, I never heard of these people, but you have to, you know, you start just reading stuff, you know. You go through, you know, maybe you'll find a sentence in a, in, a, in, a school, in a textbook, and then from that sentence you have a name. You know, I'll give you some other names that are really, you know, amazing. Biddy Mason, one of my favorite characters. She was a slave born in 1818 in Georgia. And she walked, and we talk about this in the book, and she walked 2,000 miles behind her master's covered wagon from Georgia to Southern California in 1851. And when she gets here, California is a free state, but the law was a bit murky on what to do with so-called fugitive slaves, because we had a Fugitive Slave Act here. And so she had to go to court, even though blacks could not uh, testify against whites, she had to go to a court to get her freedom. And she did, and she became a, a nurse and a midwife, and she saved all of her money. And she then moves to, San, to Los Angeles, and she, with her extra money, she buys a parcel of land. L.A. in the 1850s was a small hamlet, fewer than 4,000 people. So she buys this little property that turns out to be, in later years, smack dab in the middle of the downtown business district. So she makes a potload of money, and she trades in real estate. And what is she, and she ends up with $300,000, which today is the equivalent of $9 million. And what does she do with that? She becomes a philanthropist. She helps poor people. She helps uh, prisoners, ex-prisoners. She built the first African-American church in Los Angeles and the first school for, for African-Americans. So, you know, this is just, you know, one of those little nuggets that you start with and you just do some more research. You might find a book that was written, you know, about her somewhere. In the state library, I found an unfinished manuscript that was done in 1976 of the first four women elected to the state, state legislature. Elsewhere, I couldn't find anything. But this one woman had done all this research and had collected, you know, done written letters to people and gotten correspondence, and, and she started writing this book, but she never finished it. She died. And so over there, they've got, you know, they've got um, these manuscripts in boxes, and you just have to go through it. So, it's, you know, a lot of it is Internet research that gives you a, cl a clue or a hint, and then you pick up on it and just keep on moving. And also, I would say, if you go on the websites of, let's say, the State Archives, and the State Library, or the Huntington Library, or Bancroft Library at Berkeley, or whatever, and find, and just look at all the collections they've got, and all the holdings they've got, they have so much. I mean, I, just the other day, in, in, in prepping for this, I was, went back on the, the website of the Archives. You wouldn't believe all the stuff they've got. Probably a lot of the stuff that nobody's ever looked at is my guess, right, Nancy? I mean, there's some really obscure, you know, stuff there. But you you go through it, and it's you know it's alphabetical order, so you know, so you can you can sort of find it, and who knows what you're going to find. I'm trying to remember the name of the court case. Um, there was an African American woman in San Francisco. Mary Ellen Pleasant. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> Is she in your book? Yes, Mary Ellen. Uh, briefly, Mary Ellen Pleasant. Um, she was a former slave. She was in San Francisco. And she um, started out working in men's uh, boarding houses. And boarding houses were not what they are now. They were for, you know, they were fancy and for well-to-do men. And she would overhear the men talking about their investments. And this, we're talking about the 1850s, right? And she would make note and take notes. And so she ends up taking whatever money she has and, and putting it into mining stocks and um, Wells Fargo. And so she builds up some more money and parlays that into more money and then ends up owning boarding houses herself and laundries. And she became very wealthy. And what she did with her money is that she sent money back east to help, one, to help finance John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, and also to help finance the Underground Railroad and to find jobs and freedom for escaped slaves. And then in 1866, she's standing on a street corner with a few other African-American friends waiting for the trolley. The trolley comes by, stops, sees who she is, and keeps on going and says, you can't get on this trolley. So she filed a lawsuit. And 
she, um, she forced the company to change its policy. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we have the original court case uh, here at the state. Oh, I didn't know that. You didn't. <laughs> uh, I would have spent more time here. <laughs> Good. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.